Mr. Chad also wanted me to make sure that everyone knew that if you're interested in joining the Kirk to learn more about the Kirk of Kansas City, that you can meet next Sunday, the 20th, and then there'll be a Zoom session on the 23rd. So just let Chad know if you'd like to do that. Oh, and also I'm supposed to remind you, if you'd like to sign up for snacks to help with fellowship after the church, please do. I know everyone likes it when I do the snacks, but whew, that is a big, bountiful spread. And I can only do it like once every quarter. So we need some help. Even if you grab a group of people and decide to do fruit and vegetables or cheese and crackers or cookies, find some other people to help gather and do that fellowship for us today or work on doing that fellowship together so we can spend time together. The weather's getting warmer, so we'll be able to be outside. And we will be having more um, COVID updates about what our church and our policies will be very soon. Now that we're done with the announcements, we can get started. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. God's love endures forever. I invite all those who wish to stand to join me in our responsive call to worship. And if you are following us online, I apologize Woo, hole. Um, that you are not able to pray with us, but I hope everyone has a bulletin and in the sanctuary we will talk loud enough for you. We are called to be the people of faith in the midst of the world. And so we mix our worship and our work, our faith and our life. We gather here as people who live in the world and yet... We gather as people who have been called to see the world from a different viewpoint. God has called us together. God has called us to be part of a community. God challenges us to consider questions of priority as we encourage with the world. In this time together, may we God open our hearts, minds, and eyes, allowing us to see deeper helping us to live in a world while still offering a challenge to the ways of the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in singing our first hymn, Break Out the Hymnals, Old School Today. Come, Thou Font of Every Blessing, page 475. And then you know you're doing... Come the font of the now can you no so when do people in this room become our online today there we, are we, we good now let me take this off too <laughs> all right 
Join me in the prayer of confession, reflection, and renewal. Merciful God, we hear these words of Paul and know that his life was spent in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only in the people of his day, but to people in every age since. He could invite people to not only do as he said, but to do as he did. When we are happy to tell others to do as we say, but want the freedom to do as we choose, even if that means surrendering some of our Christian values, forgive us, O oh God. When we strive to imitate the lifestyles of the rich and the famous and ignore the plight of those who are poor and powerless, we look to others rather than Jesus Christ as the source of our standards. Forgive us, O oh God. God of grace and truth, we remember Jesus committed to travel for to give true and everlasting meaning to the depth of divine love. Empower us with the Holy Spirit to deepen our commitment to follow Jesus, even when that means being ridiculed or persecuted or sharing in the struggles and sufferings of others. We, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear the assurance of forgiveness. And so, friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. So our Old Testament reading is from Psalms 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though the army encampment against me, my heart shall not fear. Through war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord that, will see, that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on the rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry out loud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I do seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give up on me to the will of my adversaries, for false witness have risen against me. They are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. And now we have a beautiful prelude. Not prelude. <laughs> anthem. Oh, 
<laughs> I'm a little old school. I've tried the whole preaching from a tablet thing. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> so I like my pencil and paper. Our New Testament text this morning comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. By the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's crazy to think that it's been, um, I realized this week as a Facebook memory popped up, um, nine years ago this week I was preparing to end my time here at the Kirk um, as the youth director. I cannot believe it's been that long. Um, so much has happened and so much has changed um, in my life since then and I um, will forever be grateful for the time I got to share with you all um, and the way that it shaped me and my ministry and gave me confidence to take the steps to be where I am today. So thank you all. Um, as Mitch said, her and I go back quite a ways. Um, she was my youth director in high school, so that would make my 20-year high school reunion is this summer. <laughs> so that would be, we're looking at about 25 years here. I'm not sure when I got that old, but if I, that makes me that old, how old is she? <laughs> well, I had to now. I had to laugh because otherwise I'll get too sappy. And I don't want to get too sappy because if I'm honest, her impact on my life and faith has played a, a tremendous role in me standing here before you all today. Needless to say, I have a lot of memories that involve Mitch. <laughs> One of my favorite, though, is actually quite fitting for today's sermon, so I thought I would start by sharing it. With church being uh, directly across the street from our high school, my friends and I would all often go hang out with Mitch after church or after school. Um, one day during Lent, my boyfriend and I were hanging out at the church like normal. He had, we had both given up caffeine for Lent. As high school students, that was a pretty big deal. It was really hard. It's still really hard. he was also very unaware that chocolate contains caffeine. And so we're hanging out, and Mitch and I notice about the same time, he starts eating a chocolate bar. We kind of look at each other, and both immediately start to give him a hard time. After a few minutes, he started to look a little worried. So finally, Mitch was the nice one and uh, gave in and assured him that, uh, you know, God wasn't going to hate him, or stop loving him for that matter, because he broke his Linton vow. We might have both given him a really hard time for a while about it, but I don't think he held it against us too much. We kind of still laugh about it today. I asked Mitch, I was like, do you think he'll care? She's like, no, he laughs about it. We, we occasionally talk about it from time to time. But I thought it was funny being in Lent, and I'll come back to it a little bit later. It's on the second Sunday in Lent, uh, the church season leading up to Easter, where we're called to step back and reflect on the way in which we are living. The lectionary provides us with this text from Philippians, 
where Paul presents two contrasting versions of Christian life. Speaking to a small group of believers in Philippi, a proud Roman colony, Paul explains that not all those who call themselves Christians are the same. They are those he calls enemies of the cross. And then there are those like himself and his followers who stand firm in the Lord. He implores the people of Philippi to imitate him. He wants them to live in a manner that goes simply beyond following codes of conduct or rules for living, and rather to live into the fullness of life, standing firm in the Lord. And I want to spend some time exploring what Paul means by following his example and standing firm in the Lord. But before I do that, I want us to consider what it means to live as enemies of the cross. On the surface, one might not think that being an enemy of the cross is such a bad thing. After all, the cross was a tool of intimidation, of pain and suffering. Crucifixion was an act of torture. In ancient Rome, when people were crucified, it was carried out in the open, in the public space, at crossroads, where the maximum number of people could see and understand their message. Mess with the empire, and this is where you'll end up. Who would actually want to be a friend of the cross? Who would want to support such a horrible form of torture? Being an enemy of the cross only seems to make sense, especially for those who claimed to be Christians, whose Lord and Savior experienced humiliation, torture, and death by way of the Roman cross. But Paul flips things upside down here, much like Jesus did in his teachings. Paul says that it is in fact those who do not follow Jesus who are the real enemies of the cross. Those who find their identity in earthly things and live, in world, live by worldly, san, worldly standards, such as self-preservation, self-satisfaction, and self-obsession. It is those who are the enemies of the cross because they're acting in a pragmatic manner to preserve themselves. They're living for themselves and their fleshly desires. And thus, Paul says their God is their belly and their glory is their shame. This self-centered way of living was not just a problem for those who lived in Philippi at the time of Paul, but rather in every age and every place. There are always enemies of the cross, and it is no less true today in middle America than it was then. Arguably, the most popular Christian rock band of the 1990s, DC Talk, hit the nail on the head with the intro to their song, What If I Stumble. Before music even starts, the, these words are recited. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny them by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Across American culture, the lack of interest, even opposition to the Christian faith is noticeable. Congregational life has sunk into apathy and going through the motions. Those addicted to food, drugs, entertainment of all types, etc., are present in any community and offer challenges to Christians who encounter them. Paul contends that these mindsets, these actions and orientations, war against everything Christian. Those who Paul is referring to are guided by their own desires. They have not denied Christ by their confession or by their word, but have denied Christ by their behavior. They are enemies of the cross because they refuse to conform to the pattern of humility and self-sacrifice that led Jesus there. You all know, just as well as I do, there's often a very real disconnect 
between the words professed and the actions of many who call themselves Christians. Paul recognizes this, and that's why he writes this letter to the Philippians, encouraging them to stand firm in the Lord. Paul's plea is that they follow his lead, living the way of Christ, being a faithful imitator of Paul, is being a faithful imitator of Christ. And the cross is always central in the imitation of, cro- of Christ. Paul's confidence is held by the way in which Jesus approached the cross. Jesus faithfully loved. Even as he died, he continued to love and trust God. It was in love that God raised him from the dead. It is this power of love that is the greatest power. And it is in this power that Paul appeals to, Christ, to his Christ-following family to stand firm. To follow the way of Jesus is to love and accept the death imposed by the imperial power. To love whatever the cost is a refusal to accept and bow to the values of the empire. This love is not passive. Love, rather, is active in forgiveness and mercy and kindness. Love is creative, even in the midst of destruction. Love is relational, even as relationships are broken and death ensues. Love is hopeful, even in the midst of despair. And love is trusting. It is into this type of love that Paul encouraged the community of believers in Philippi to live. And it is into this type of love that we are called to live today as well. It's also important to note that this kind of living is not a solitary job, but rather one that is best done in community. Paul is directing the gaze of the community not towards some type of individual perfection, not some perfect way of living, getting it all right. It's not even towards the supreme perfection of Christ, but rather to the realization of Christ's love within community itself. The community is never perfect. It struggles to understand how faith is lived in the world and in a particular local context. Paul holds that struggle as the way of right living. Engage in faith, or engage the faith in the messiness of life, he says. Not just individually, but as a community. Thus, the enemies of the cross are those who make their own lives the focus of their attention. This is what the church should be. The church is to be the body of Christ. It should be a community bound by God's love. And in response to God's love, we are called to love. When questioned, Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is not only a command for us as individuals, but as for the church as well. The body of Christ, shining the light of God's love for all the world to see. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. This is the life Paul is pleading with the people of Philippi to choose. When he encourages them to stand firm in the Lord. This plea is no less significant today. For those of us who call ourselves Christians. Than it was for his small community of believers. Then. Yet, as the words from DC Talk harshly remind us, we aren't doing a very good job of this. Indian social activist Mahatma Gandhi made an equally harsh critique of Christianity, saying, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. As does popular rock band Hozier, with their hit song, Take Me to Church. The songwriter and lead singer, Andrew Hozier, uh, 
Brian sings about the love he experiences in his romantic partner. And in comparison, he believes the church. The church that is supposed to be rooted and bound together in love. To be a bleak place that spits out poison at those who attend. In the chorus, he sings, Take me to church. I'll worship like a dog at the shrine of your lies. I'll tell you my sins and you can sharpen your knife. He claims that the church demeans its attendees and attacks them for the things they do when those things go against some prescribed church doctrine or set of rules. In an interview, he shares that the song is meant to call out the homophobic legalistic teachings and practices of many churches who value rules and prejudice over the love and acceptance they claim to stand for. He says the love he finds in his partner is more real and authentic than anything he finds from the church. Those are some pretty harsh words to hear. A 2018 Pew Research study found that 60% of people who were raised in the church but no longer claim religious affiliation, so these are those who would call themselves atheist or agnostic or believing nothing in particular, cite their main reason for leaving church is because they deeply question the teachings of the church. In other words, it's the disconnect between the loving God whom the church claims to worship, what is taught, and what is lived out each and every day by those in the church. If I'm being honest with you, standing before you as a person going through the ordination process to be a minister of Warden Sacrament in the Presbyterian Church USA, I too often struggle with this institution that we call church today. I have personally been deeply hurt by the church in many ways throughout my life, as I'm sure many of you have. I have wrestled with doubts because I have been condemned and excluded for nothing less or nothing more than living fully into the person God created me to be. But I have also felt immense fullness, comfort, grace, healing, welcome, and joy that comes with God's love through the body of Christ. So this morning, on this second Sunday of Lent, I come to you much as Paul did to those in Philippi, imploring and encouraging you to stand firm in the Lord. Let this season be what it is intended to be. Let it be a time to step back and reflect on how we are individually living as well as how we are living as a community. What does that look like? Well, I think it's important to start by remembering that Lent is more than giving up something, whether it's coffee, caffeine, whether it's the alarm clock or the snooze button, which I did one year that was epic failure. <laughs> um, we won't go there. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're giving it up for the sake of giving something up, it's not worth it. It defeats the purpose. It's about more than following a prescribed set of rules and regulations or keeping a detailed record of what we and others did right and or wrong. It's more than simply going through the motions of being Christians and being the church. And it's more than our limited human understanding of God's love. Rather, it's recognizing that we cannot put God in a box. We cannot put limits on God's love. It's being aware of the motives behind our actions and reconnecting what we profess to believe with the way in which we actually live. It's about imagining ways to follow the example of Jesus through humble and self-sacrificial living for the sake of others. It's about living fully into what Jesus said is the most important thing. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And this is both individually and as the body of Christ. And it's resting in the promise 
that even when we do mess up, because we're going to, nothing can separate us from God's love. I want us to take the words of Hosier, take me to church, and the cynical and sarcastic meaning he puts behind them, and flip them upside down. Let our words and deeds be so different that when people, or than what people are used to, then when we, people encounter us, they can't help but ask why. Why are they different? And when we share that it's the limitless nature of God's love, they can't help but say, take me to church. But how, you ask? I can't tell each and every one of you that, other than it starts with love. And with love as the backdrop, I want to offer you these three simple questions. One, whom do you want to be like? Two, what do you want out of life? And three, how open are you to being changed? As you ponder those questions, I want to leave you this morning with an unknown quote I stumbled across a few years ago. Act in such a manner that you are living proof of a loving God. Amen. words of grace and how we need to be an example. So our worship service, and actually uh, on a personal note, I do have to say that I was a lot meaner to Jason when I told him <laughs> that when he was eating chocolate, I might have said he was going to be condemned to death. So thank you for not saying that part. Um, but we had a good conversation after that, and he, he did understand he was not condemned. So... <laughs> Our worship service always includes a moment of thanksgiving. This is an opportunity to make note of God's many gifts in our lives and where we pledge ourselves to use those gifts as God invites us to use them, namely to make the world a better place for others, to reinvest them in other people for the common good, and to show people and to get people to want to come to church. 
We are grateful for all you do in your own communities and through this church to share God's love and compassion. If you're looking for a place to do that, we'd love to have you join us here at the Kirk. We cannot do the work without your support, your energy, and your compassion. Your financial support helps enable our ministries and mission. If you're worshiping on site, we have offering plates available in the narthex. You can also contact the church office for more information about how you can take part in our common work. Both your contributions here among us and your work in the wider world, we thank you for your spirit of generosity and for those of all of you, for all of you that strive to be Christ's hands and feet in the world. I ask you to please join me in prayer with the prayer of thanksgiving that is printed in the bulletin. For the ways you love us, we say thank you. For the ways you provide for us, we say thank you. For the opportunity to give, we say thank you. For the kingdom work this offering will do, we say thank you. For letting us be a part of your work, we say thank you. May the thankful words on our lips and the thought thankful meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before I pray, I would like to um, lift up a couple prayer requests that were passed along to share. Uh, Susan Combs, her friend Annette, will undergo chemotherapy for kid kidney cancer, which has spread. In prayers for Matt's family on the death of his daughter. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we praise you for the mercy shown grace giving, living water, spirit's power. We ask you for daily strength, hope for tomorrow, your word to guide, strong feet to follow. The psalmist says, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior. And my hope is in you all day long. God of the oppressed, we bring to you the broken ones, forgotten ones, exploited and abused ones. Bring freedom and release, love and compassion to damaged hearts and souls. We lift them before you now. God of compassion, Hear our prayers. God of the distressed, we bring to you the grieving ones, hurting ones, suffering and wounded ones. Bring wholeness and healing, comfort and relief to broken bodies and minds. God of compassion, hear our prayers. We bring to you the lonely ones, the homeless ones, thirsty, tired, and penniless ones. Bring hope and sustenance, physical and spiritual food to hungry bodies and souls. God of compassion, hear our prayer. The Lord is good to all and has compassion on all God has made. May the peace, love, and compassion of the Lord be with you now and always. And we pray together, lifting all of those needs that have been voiced into the community and those we hold close to our hearts. As we pray in the manner Jesus taught his disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is We Are One in the Spirit, number 300. Please stand if you are able. Friends, act in such a manner that you are living proof of a loving God. As you leave this place, go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen.